Welcome, everybody. Um, this is a relatively new format for us, and this is going to be actually our first one in this format. Um, so we, I will actually do a short intro here to our guest that will be hosting the webinar today. So my guest is uh, Matt Drozinski. Uh, Matt is the co-founder and CEO of Pilot, uh, which is a platform that makes it easy to hire and pay people outside of the U.S. Um, he is an expert in payroll and compliance for remote teams has worked for a number of years uh, remotely and has advised hundreds of companies uh, on going remote and all things remote work. So uh, we are excited to have him on and, and he'll take it away here shortly. Um, before, we, before I hand it over to Matt, I'm just gonna let you all know that um, we're doing a, we have a bit of an announcement here tomorrow. So for everybody that signed up for this webinar, um, please be sure to check your emails tomorrow as we have an exciting update and um, we're excited to welcome you all to this uh, new thing we've been working on and we're excited about it. So uh, please be sure to check your emails tomorrow. And without further ado, uh, Matt Drzinski, welcome to uh, the webinar. Awesome, thanks Matt, uh, it's great to be on. Uh, so hi everyone, um, we'll try to um, cover the ins and outs of, of remote worker compliance. So what does it take for you to be able to work anywhere or for companies anywhere? A um, Couple of like very short, housekeeping announcements where I'm going to try to keep it short 30 minutes tops for uh, the main part of the presentation and then we'll have about 30 minutes uh, hopefully more for questions. Um, this presentation is being recorded so you will all have access to the recording um, after the call and if you have any questions you can use the Q&A feature. Uh, Justine will be helping me uh, pick out the the questions, and I'll 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 do my best to uh, to answer them all. Um, so as Matt mentioned, um, the reason why I'm doing this call, and the reason why you should, uh, you know, um, uh, basically pay any attention to what I'm saying, is because I started a company called Pilot. We do payroll benefits and compliance for remote teams. And we're backed by Y Combinator Automatic, one of the largest uh, distributed teams in the world is an investor in Pilot. We support hundreds of companies uh, hiring remotely all over the world, and we help them with paying their team members, either as contractors or as employees, letting them effectively put anyone on payroll in any country around the world. Um, for you all, if the company that you work for were to use Pilot, um, you get a bunch of benefits as well. We do payments to close to 100 countries. Payments go straight into your bank account. Uh, in a lot of places, we support local payments with no fees and benefits like health insurance for contractors as well. Um, but this is not a pitch of pilot. Um, I just wanted to, to mention, like, I have about 10 years of experience working remotely and running distributed teams. So I've seen it on both sides as a founder, uh, running distributed companies and also as a distributed worker. So um, I've actually never worked, I think, for a company that um, that was like predominantly in one location. I've always been distributed. I've worked from all over the world, the UK, the US, Australia, Argentina, Chile, Thailand, um, a bunch of a bunch of different places. Um, and I've advised over a hundred companies on how to set up their remote teams. So the the reason why we're even having this conversation is that hiring abroad is really hard and kind of working for international companies is hard. And it really stems from the fact that each country is different, right? Every country has its own rules. And those rules are what companies that you are, you all are going to be working for have to follow, right? So if they have a, a consultant in uh, Brazil, for example, they will need to comply with the local employment laws in that country, whether they're hiring someone as a contractor or an employee. So, um, so this is a very concerning thing for companies as they're trying to expand and hire internationally as how do I deal with all of this complexity? How do I, how do I bring this person on board that happens to be in, you know, say, uh, Krakow, Poland? How do I, how do I hire them? How do I pay them? How do I make sure that I'm not making any mistakes that I'll regret in the future when it comes to compliance and payroll and how it's all set up? So the majority of companies, when they hire internationally, they hire people as contractors. If any of you have worked for a company outside of the country that you're in, uh, you will see that as uh, the predominant model, right? So 
that means the majority of for the majority of you that's the that's the model that you will um that you will have um experience with right and that you will uh, you will see on your own basis for most of you if you end up getting hired by a remote company you're going to be a contractor and there's nothing wrong with that it's the more lightweight model it has its benefits in a lot of cases it has benefits for you as well in many jurisdictions that means you're paying lower taxes for example you have more control um over over kind of like your faith and your company um there are some benefits there um that said for companies what they really have to think about is whether you can be a contractor right so there's a lot of questions that companies are going to ask themselves um can i hire this person as a contractor and is this legal right like how do i do that um and this applies both internationally and domestically like if you have a if you're a us contractor working for a us company some of these rules apply as well the biggest two concerns for companies when they hire internationally are uh, is worker classification and ip right so when it comes to ip all they care about is like is the intellectual property that you're creating for them uh is it going to be theirs you know like is it safely transferred to the company that's paying you for your services right and then worker classification wise all they care about is is the local government eventually going to be on my back and saying hey this person should have been an employee uh, you hire them as a contractor um you will now have to pay all of these taxes and all of these penalties right so this is why companies are reluctant to hire internationally um that said there is way to structure these types of relationships in a way that minimizes both you and the company's risk so for worker classification there is a bunch of criteria that can be applied to determine whether you are a, an independent contractor or an employee right and i'm just going to go to go through these very quickly you'll see those on the slides and if you have more questions you can always reach out to me after the call but effectively it comes down to whether you whether you as the individual working have control over your work whether you can substitute yourself for someone else or can you subcontract your work to another person uh, do you have to fix mistakes that you that you create on your own time uh does your pay depend on how long the job takes to finish or is it kind of like fixed project based work can you work for more than one customer can your business make a loss or a profit or is it basically always making the same amount of money and there's no risk involved do you get paid time off do you have to buy your own, your own materials like equipment you know so like do you have your own laptop effectively um uh, is the company obliged to provide you with work if they ask you to do work are you required to perform it or can you say no if something goes wrong whose liability is it or is more than you know 50% of your income coming from the time that you put in as opposed to the company that you created so different countries have different frameworks for evaluating these but it's always a flavor of these types of questions right and the reason why you need to care about this is not only because if you can justify this to the customer as to why they're not at risk they more they're more likely to be able to hire you but also you minimizing the risks to yourself as well um because there are circumstances under which if there is a worker classification dispute and it turns out that the government would classify you as an employee as opposed to a contractor you can also be personally liable for some of those taxes and not just the company right so these are the useful sort of frameworks and and ideas to keep in mind um do you have to register your own company um this again depends on the jurisdiction uh it's good practice to have like a single person limited liability company or a local equivalent to work with folks internationally some countries have a more lightweight version of uh they're sometimes called uh being like a private entrepreneur or a sole proprietor uh so those are also great options in most cases there are registration thresholds as in if you meet if you make more than a certain amount of money from your company you have to register it right so just make sure to check what the local laws are in your country if you're self-employed if you're being hired as a contractor at what point do you have to register and what does that entail in many places the sole proprietor option is a fairly lightweight process usually doesn't take a lot to do that registration and it tends not to have a ton of impact on your taxes so i generally recommend that that you would do that as well and again it also gives the company peace of mind that you know you're registered and sort of done this correctly um a lot of questions that i get from both companies and contractors are around being able to be compensated with stock options this would be especially common if you're you know going to work for a us based startup where stock based compensation is is sort of you know the de facto standard 
um, you will, um, the short answer to this question is that yes, a US company can issue stock to you as an international contractor or a consultant. So there's no um, sort of issues there. What you need to make sure is that from your standpoint, you're not going to be hit with an unexpected tax bill by getting paid in stock, right? So in a lot of jurisdictions, stock is not taxed um, when, or options are not, ta ta are not taxed when you get them. They're taxed when you actually exercise the option, get the underlying stock and then sell it, right? So they're only, they're only actually taxed on sale, but that's not the case for most, for all jurisdictions, right? So again, you kind of need to be mindful of, of whether, uh, how that's going to to look and whether you're not going to get by hit by an unexpected tax bill. Um, should you get an accountant? Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, um, a lot of this stuff is complicated and you're going to have questions around like, what is my tax bill going to look like? A lot of, uh, a lot of the time, if you run a, a single person company or you're a sole proprietor, your taxes are going to be um, your taxes are going to, there's going to be special filings that you have to make to be able to report those taxes. Um, so in general, getting, um, getting some kind of, um, getting some kind of an accountant or a CPA is, is really good practice. They'll help you get out of a lot of, uh, trouble, potential trouble. Um, and they will also help you with uh, some of these questions that I've mentioned before, like, you know, if I have, um, if I get stock, uh, is this going to, what impact is it going to have on, is it going to have on my taxes, right? Um, should you get insurance? So a lot of the time, especially when you work with larger companies, they might ask you if you have insurance coverage or they might not ask you, but you'll see that in the contract they send you, right? They'll say something like the consultant will get professional indemnity insurance coverage up to um, a certain amount, say up to like $1 million in liability. This is extremely common, especially with larger employers, right? Because what they want to protect themselves is you making a mistake, it's going to cost them money. And it's common practice that if you're an independent contractor, you take on a lion's share of that risk of making a potential mistake, right? So we've seen when we're sort of helping workers around the world, sometimes the, the company will just say, hey, like, I just won't hire you if you don't have this insurance. The unfortunate news is that in a lot of jurisdictions, this insurance is not actually that easy to get. Um, you can go to custom, like sort of specialty brokers and they might be able to help you get professional liability insurance or it's sometimes called professional indemnity insurance or errors and emissions insurance. Um, so we generally recommend that it's not required that you have this coverage when you're performing work internationally. Just be aware that this might pop up, right? So you might have a customer that will effectively ask you for it or will require that you have it. In which case, you know, you'll probably want to talk to a broker, see if you can get this insurance locally. If not, see if there is a, an equivalent insurance that you can get and then go talk to your customer and say, hey, I have this coverage which covers X, Y, Z. It's not exactly professional liability, but it's similar and it covers me up to this, this, this sort of dollar limit, right? And a lot of the time, these, these sort of uh, insurance requirements are negotiable. Some companies are going to have a hard line where they say we can't work with someone um, who doesn't have insurance, in which case your only options are getting that insurance. Uh, finding a different company to work for, or sometimes working for a local agency who will basically put you under their insurance. So that's that's also pretty common. Um, another type of insurance that you might care about is health insurance, right? So um, I'm I'm based in the U.S. where the uh, the you know by there's there's no kind of like public healthcare system really, uh, but a lot of you work in countries that uh, are much better in that regard. So you might not need to get supplemental or like additional private health insurance. That said, it's something that a lot of, we get a lot of questions about folks who want that additional coverage. Um, we generally recommend a company called Safety Wing. Um, they have, they basically do global health insurance for remote workers, uh, works in I think 180 countries. Um, it's a really great product. Um, if your company uses pilot 
you'll, you get 15% off, I think, of any of the health insurance plans if you enroll through Pilot. So, um, but you can also enroll just on your own. It's, it's, a great, it's a great option. Or you can find a local, a local insurer as well. Um, that can also be, uh, that can also be a, a, a good option. Um, all right. So my company told me they'll be withholding 30% of my income in taxes. What do I do? Okay. So um, when you're working with US-based companies, um, they have tax withholding requirements where if they're remitting funds to a foreign contractor or a consultant, um, they would have to withhold taxes in the US for you unless there are certain circumstances that are met, right? Um, fortunately for you, if you're performing services for a company outside of the US, in 99% of cases, there are no tax withholding requirements that, so, so the company basically shouldn't be withholding taxes for you. Um, the only circumstances under which they would is if you're getting paid for a royalty or a license or something like that. It's not for the service that you're providing, it's for a product that you're selling to them, right? So there might be tax withholding requirements in some of those circumstances, but in general, what you should tell them is that, hey, I'm performing services for you outside of the US. This is not considered US sourced income and therefore I'm not subject to any tax withholding. Um, there is a, a, a sort of an easier and more formal way to give your company that answer. And that is through something called the WAPN form. So you might have seen companies ask you for this uh, it's a pretty intimidating form, especially the WAB and E version for companies. It's like, I think like eight or 10 pages long and it's, you know, pretty complicated. Um, so I, um, I would, um, but it's, it's, it's actually not that hard once you kind of read through all the answers. There's a lot of questions that you can skip, but it's effectively a form that helps you certify that the income that you're receiving is not US sourced income. And um, it's, a, it's a form that you, you'll fill out, give to the company, and this for the company that allows them to not do any tax withholding because now they have documentation that they shouldn't have to do it, right? So um, if you've been asked to fill this form out um, and you don't know how to do it, there's instructions on the IRS, IRS's website, but you can always ping me or you can ping our support team at supportedpilot.co. We're more than happy to, we're very happy to help you kind of figure out how to, how to fill that form out. Um, but it's something that you'll very commonly be asked by um, a US-based uh, company, um, usually before or together with your first payment because the tax withholding requirements usually kick in when you, spend, when you send more than $600 to a particular employee in a year. Um, so what if you wanted to be an actual employee, not a contractor, right? I mean, is it, is it so much to ask? And, um, I'm going to answer this question from like the company standpoint. Um, you, in some countries you can make this decision on your own. Like there are options for you to effectively kind of register as an employee and pay your own taxes, um, as an employee without setting up a company. Um, but that's not available everywhere. So what you um what you can do so so what what you have to do instead is convince your company to hire you as an employee and companies really only have three options to make that happen right so they can create a company in the country that you're in so they can create a local subsidiary there and they can put you on payroll through that local subsidiary which a lot of companies really don't like that option because um it costs a lot of money up front they would have to do it, like especially if they have to do it for just one employee. A lot of the time, it's cost prohibitive. It can cost you know tens of thousands of dollars to set up a foreign subsidiary. Uh, you need a local lawyer, a local accountant, um, and a lot of the time, it makes your U.S. taxes a lot more complicated as well. So companies generally don't like to do that um, unless they really, really have to, right? So a subsidiary is not always an option. A branch office is available in some countries, not in all of them, which is a kind of a more light, it's like a more lightweight version of a subsidiary where you're still a foreign corporation, but you get like a local um, employment number. So especially for those of you who are in Canada, you might see that quite commonly with US-based companies running payroll in Canada using their US company instead of having a local Canadian, Canadian subsidiary. 
um, but that's not not available in all jurisdictions. And last but not least, there is the PEO or EOR option. So what this stands for is PEO stands for Professional Employer Organization, and EOR stands for Employer of Record. So these are companies that will effectively have local uh, entities in different jurisdictions around the world, and they will allow you to put you on payroll in that jurisdiction where you get all of the regular tax withholding, social security, you are effectively an employee, but the company doesn't have to go through the hassle of setting up their own subsidiary because the PEO or the EOR has done it already, right? So it's kind of like shared employment infrastructure. Um, these solutions have historically been pretty terrible. <laughs> They're like basically service companies um, that, that, that do that. Um, but there's now a couple of kind of like more modern, more startup-like uh, products that are trying to address this including pilot. We're not the only option out there. So, you know, go check your options out. Um, but, you know, we support employment in, in close to a hundred countries um, and can uh, basically help your customers put you on payroll in any of those jurisdictions. Um, so that was a quick rundown of like kind of like the key points, I think that you need to be aware of when you are hiring internationally. I'm happy to answer any questions or dig into any of these, these topics in more detail. So whatever you want me to cover, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I try to cover most of the things that will be relevant to, to all of you here today. Um, so I see that we already have some questions, but um, feel free to, uh, to, file away, to, to fire away and, uh, and, and ask more as well. That was great, Matt. Thanks so much. Uh, this is oh, Justine here for everyone um, who hasn't, uh, who doesn't know. This is Justine from We Work Remotely. So we'll start this uh, Q and A session here now. Um, William asks, uh, "Does NAFTA change any of this for people in North America?" Um, so I don't think NAFTA itself has any provisions in it that make it any easier or more difficult to hire across these borders. I think what really, but that said, you do have more, employ more employers within those jurisdictions hiring across borders, right? So you have folks, you know, hiring in Canada or US company hiring in Canada, the other way around, you have folks hiring in Mexico. So like those, the, these trade agreement help, this, this trade agreement helps, but it's not really enough for the company to be like, oh, it's now easy for me to hire in Mexico. There are still a bunch of hoops that they have to, uh, that they have to jump through. So, um, so from, from what I've, from what I've, we haven't really seen impact of this, of this making it any easier. Um, but, you know, like your experience may vary, I think. Um, Got it. Um, awesome. So William says, thank you for your response in the chat there. Um, so here's a second question. Um, this person says, I just went fully remote in March for a UK based company. I'm an independent contractor in California. Is there a place where I can get more guidance on paying taxes and getting all of that in order? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question. So, um, if you are working for a UK based company, but you're based in California, um, you don't have to concern yourself with UK taxes, right? So that's, that's very good news for you, right? That you don't need to find a local, a, a local accountant or a local lawyer in the UK because you are performing those services in California, right? So you're just a consultant. So basically any resources that you find that apply to um, a working as a contractor um, domestically will also work in your scenario when you're working for a UK based company. Um, so your best resources, are, I mean, I would probably recommend getting a CPA, especially in the beginning. Um, you don't necessarily need to get one that's extremely well versed in, um, in remote work or, or international in this specific scenario. Um, it would be helpful, and I can possibly I can probably send you some recommendations for California-based CPAs as well. 
Um, so that would be my that would be my recommendation is is find a local accountant that can help you with with, with these questions. Awesome. Um, so we have another question here. Um, sorry, one sec here. Okay, are accountants, in your experience, well versed in the issues of remote work and being a contractor for international companies? Is there an online resource here you'd recommend if local resources aren't adequate other than your own service? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the accountants tend to be pretty well versed in this um, just because they, it's very common for companies to do international trade, right? So at least on that side of like the logistics of the taxes that you might have to pay, how to issue invoices to an international company, what registrations you have to, you have to do. Accountants are a great resource for that. Um, the reason why I can't easily recommend great resources for it is because, as I've mentioned in the beginning, every country is different. So unfortunately, it's not like there is a single resource that you can go to to see, hey, this is resources for contractors anywhere in the world working for companies in the US. You really have to go to find local resources for you know, say you're based in Argentina, you need to find local resources for Argentina specifically, right? So again, accountants are a very good kind of first line for getting some of these questions um, answered and, and getting, getting guidance. Um, they are not always going to be um, the best uh, at, especially when you're dealing with stock-based compensation, that's sometimes where I've seen accountants be a little bit unclear on that you usually need to find a tax advisor which is different than an accountant so they can sometimes have more information on that aspect of it specifically uh, but if you don't get paid in stock then um, then that's less of a less of a concern but yeah i would say i would say accountants to in general are pretty well versed in this um, where, where you will find difficulty and, I, and again I've, I've sort of talked about the simplest scenario, which is you are based in a single country, right? And you kind of like, you you might be working for different companies around the world, but you're not like a digital nomad, right? Where it becomes a lot trickier for you is when you travel a lot, right? And then you start falling under the remit of different tax jurisdictions. And that's when you really have to start being um, a lot more mindful of how how do I structure this? In which country do I set up my company? What tax implications does it have? Um, and that's where it, where it can become a little bit more difficult. I think there's probably, I imagine there is a, as a Slack channel on We Work Remotely on your community where you can ask some of these questions and get other people's feedback on it. Um, I've had uh, some good conversations with folks at a, with the community at Nomad List as well. Um, so for that specific circumstance, if you are more nomadic, uh, those can be great resources as well. Yes, that would be a great question to ask in our Slack community. Um, you could ask that in the advice channel. Um, here's another great question. Um, if I know my company is not following the rules here, and I'm worried about the implications of that, for example, my job security in a very uncertain time, What's the best way to approach the subject? Uh, limit the backlash to limit the backlash. Yeah, that's a really good. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's going to be a little bit hard for me to. Um, it's going to be a little bit hard for me to 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 answer this question without having uh, a little bit more detail on what the company might be doing and how they're not following the rules. So, if you want to. Um, you can you can me direct message me through chat, I think, if you wanted to give more context, or you can email me after this call at mattedpilot.co and I can, I'll be happy to give you some advice. Um, I think the short story is that if you are being an employee, but they're hiring you as a contractor, if that's the sort of um, not following the rules that, that, that you're talking about, then, um, there shouldn't be there shouldn't be very many implications for you directly in most cases it's the company that really is on the hook when it comes to that right so 
Um, so that that that's sort of, you know, just to reassure you a little bit, it's unlikely that you'll be in trouble. What you can get in trouble is that if you're not remitting that that the taxes on that income in any way, right? Then, then obviously you're kind of both uh, culpable in, in that scenario. So that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult. I think the way to, um, to get your company uh, more on board in, uh, and, and kind of like, kind of get them moving towards the right, in the right direction would be to bring up their risks that they take on, right? And kind of like have a conversation with them and say, hey, like, I know that it's difficult for you guys to hire me in this country. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I was on this webinar and they are talking about all of the risk and I kind of understand that this is a difficult issue. Um, but, you know, maybe there are some things that we can improve in terms of, for example, our consulting agreement and the way that, this is, that it is structured, right? So I think the important thing is like, you're not going to easily convince them to do switch from contracting to full employment because uh, it's going to be, like quite expensive for the company again and especially if you're worried about the sort of uncertainty of the current times they're unlikely to do it but like one of the things that we can for example do it with pilot and the company would would get some advantages through pilot is that like we have locally compliant consulting agreements that are tailored for each country and for and we we take care of like some additional compliance checks for the company as well and there is very little risk for them to try pilot because it's like it's $20 per contractor per month. It's as much as they're paying to their, um, to their, in, for like for their international wires anyway. Um, and that kind of gives them on the path of like starting to care about compliance. So it is like a, it, a lot of the time it can be like an education type type question, right? Where you have to like bring up that this is a concern. You can mention that, hey, I have maybe like some friends that are getting paid through pilot or I've seen this this product that seems to tackle compliance, you know, can we look into it? So that's kind of how I would probably um, go about it. And uh, yeah, you, you there are other platforms that do compliance for international team members. So it's not necessarily just that you have to, you know, you have to call pilot out. You can give the company a couple of options. Um, but that's, I think, what I would do as the first step. Thanks for that. That's that's really helpful, I think. And that was a very um, important question there. Um, so the next one here is, are there specific countries that allow for easier setup and hiring when it comes to starting a business? Um, anything you'd recommend? Um, so it depends. It depends whose perspective we're answering this, this question from. I'm not sure if I'm understanding it. Uh, correctly. So, um, if um, I don't know if we're talking about a contractor starting their business to be able to get hired easily, or is it a company starting a business to make it easier for them to hire? It's I, that's a, I'm, I'm not entirely clear on on the question. I think, but um, so when when you're setting up a company um, and you are um, and you are self um, and you're going to be uh, kind of contracting through it, you basically have, I think, two options, right? So there is the, you can set up a company in um, the country that you're in. That's like the default option for most people, right? Um, because um, that's, you know, like it's going to be the easiest for you most likely. And, um, and it's probably the easiest for your personal taxes as well. So that's one option. And then another option would be to set up a company in, a country that has a very well established legal system and a legal framework that your customer might be familiar with, right? So setting up a single person LLC or a C Corp in the US might be a good option. The UK is a very popular destination, especially for folks in Europe, right? Because you then have all of your documents are in English, right? And if your company asks you for like your incorporation documents or contracts, things like that, English law is pretty similar to American law in many ways. So I know that a lot of folks that are in Europe would set up a, a, a limited company in, in the UK to, to use to be able to, uh, to, to work with, with US-based companies. So, so that's, that's a pretty good option. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, if I'm understanding this question, that, that, that I think are the options that I, would, that I would recommend. I think for a lot of European folks, I, there's a, Estonia might be a good option as well with their e-residency program. I've heard good things about that as well. Awesome. 
So Andre here is asking, are there any restrictions regarding GDPR law for European companies hiring people from the countries outside of EU? Um, so there aren't necessarily restrictions, but there are caveats that you have to um, that you have to be mindful of. So the main thing would be um, would be data transfer, really. So you know, like you probably have seen all of these the, the privacy policies with with GDPR, um, and if the company is like just in Europe and just serving European customers they might not have the right clauses in the privacy policy in terms of service to allow for transfer of data outside of the EEA. Um, that said, a lot of European companies, unless they're in a very specific circumstances, probably use service providers like Dropbox or Gmail that are outside of the, um, the, U the, the European Union in many cases. And they might already have these uh, contract model clauses and things like that set up for, for GDPR for that purpose, in which case, having employees outside of the EU is not as difficult, right? It's really difficult when that's like the first thing that you do outside of the, outside of the EU. So I would say that's the main, that's the main restriction really. Um, but it is possible to structure privacy policy and stuff in a way where you can transfer data outside of the EEA, including to employees that work for you outside of the EEA and not run into significant issues with that. Thank you. Um, here's another great question. Um, how do you negotiate fair compensation as a remote employee? How do the companies set salary for remote workers? Is location usually one of the key factors? I, I love this question. Um, I, was, I was recently on a podcast when I, when I was actually asked the same thing. Um, and the short story is that there's basically two models that I've seen companies follow, right? Um, and there's no like right or wrong answer to, to which model like is best for the company. I can argue for one or the other and I can find reason for one or the other. So the two models are that you try to have uniform compensation across the board, um, regardless of location, right? So that you don't look at location at all in determining compensation because your view as a company is that you should be compensating everyone the same if they're doing the same work. Right. And therefore, if someone is in another country, they should still be compensated the same. So that's one approach. Companies like Basecamp, for example, follow that approach. Pilot follows that approach. Um, but but the, there is another very common approach, which is to adjust compensation based on cost of living. And there was a good argument that that's that that, that is also a fair option. Right. Because um, if you think about like if you think about compensation, and value that or like how someone is getting compensated measuring it in dollars right and like kind of absolute monetary amounts is just one way of looking at it right another way of looking at it is you could look at purchase power right and like lifestyles right like is this person that i'm getting paid do they have a comparable lifestyle to someone else getting paid the same in another country right so that's usually the argument for adjusting compensation based on cost of living is that you want everyone to have a comparable standard of living. And therefore, if I pay someone who is in a lower income country, the same amount that I'm paying someone who is in a higher income country, suddenly that person in a lower income country is a lot better off for the same amount that I'm spending, right? And therefore that's unfair to the employees that are in the higher income countries. So I, I see both, right? So, um, I don't know which one is more common, probably the one that way you adjust compensation based on cost of living, because in many ways it's, you know, it's like better for the company. It's cheaper for the company a lot of the times. Um, so that, that I think is, is the more common one, right? Um, when it comes to negotiating fair compensation, um, I mean, the first thing would be to kind of like understand where on that um, debate your company stands, right? And kind of how, how they feel about it. Um, you can generally get pretty close to, like say it's a US based company, you can generally get pretty close to ne like negotiating a kind of US based rates by saying that, hey, like look at all of the expenses that you're not paying. I don't need an office space. You like saving money on payroll taxes. Like there's a lot of benefits for the company to, to do that. So um, 
so so that's kind of how i would try to phrase that i would focus on like look this is the value that i'm creating and look at my work compared to the other employees work that that are that are um that are that are doing it i would uh point out the potential cost savings regardless of how you are getting paid and then i would also um um i i think i would i mean it depends on what position you're in but you know there are a bunch of companies that are offering us based compensation for folks that have come, that are that are outside of the us so you can kind of point out to the fact that hey like it seems that this is starting to be more common and there's a bunch of other companies that are that are paying this way and instead of kind of like insisting that hey you should do this too you can ask the company like what are your thoughts on this and like how do you feel about that and why and are you following the same uh the same standard the same practices as some of these companies right so you can kind of have them have to explain why they won't offer you why they won't match the you know someone someone salary in the US and then that will give you arguments to negotiate against them in that conversation right if they say oh but this is more expensive for us or there's this or this time zones so then you can maybe say hey like i'm willing to work in your time zone right if i can get the same uh, salary as the us counterparts right so that's that's how i would think about this negotiation yeah well said it's uh definitely a hot topic in the remote work world right now we probably could do a whole separate webinar <laughs> on that yeah yeah for sure um so let's see here um next question here is uh sorry oh here we go uh can i as an american set up an uh domicile a company anywhere or do i need citizenship of that country in most countries you don't need to be a citizen to be able to set up a a company so as an american citizen you could set up a company in the uk with no issues at all right um you would need a local address but there's usually services that can provide you with a with a with a uk address to do that and that exists in other countries as well so some countries have um restrictions uh when you're setting up a company on effectively what they're calling like 100% foreign capital companies so if you are starting a, a a corporation in another country and there's no shareholders that are local to that jurisdiction in some countries you won't be able to set it up um i know that my co-founder went through that process in uh in poland once where it used to be that you needed to have at least 1% or some fraction of a percent share uh of a local uh national to be able to set up a company but that said in those jurisdictions there's usually services that will uh kind of offer that you know as a as a service effectively where there will be a local representative that will um act as a a small minority shareholder in your company and as a local representative so uh so there are options out there but it, it typically you can set up companies uh outside of your jurisdiction and um without without having to be a, a, a citizen one thing to keep in mind though is there are some cases where the type of the company that you set up might have impact on your taxes right so for example if you're a US citizen and you're setting up like a single person LLC in another country for the US tax purposes that entity will often time be considered a disregarded entity and therefore you might still get taxed for the income that that company has in the US um so um that wouldn't apply to like a corporation so that tends to be a better better option in a lot of cases uh, but yeah just something to keep in mind awesome uh rob here asks is there a resource you'd recommend for navigating a digital nomad remote work situation in regards to health insurance employee benefits taxes etc um I don't think I have any other resources other than the ones that you have mentioned which would be you know the slack channels that we work remotely the nomad list community is another really good one um those I think are probably the best uh places where you'll you'll be able to find other people that are in the same situation as you are unfortunately the like being a digital nomad is still fairly <laughs> fairly new concept and it's not very well supported under international like and local law right so a lot of the time and i i've been in this boat myself right like i 
I was born in Poland, I spent some time in Germany, then lived in the UK for a while, and now I'm in the US, and in the interim I traveled the world and I was working from a bunch of different places that I've mentioned before. And unfortunately there is no good answer to a lot of these questions. Like um, a lot of the time you'll have to figure it out on your own, unfortunately, as much as I would like to say that there is a, a sort of a clear playbook. So finding other people that have done it through these online communities is probably your best bet at a kind of like figuring out what are the tools, services uh, that can help you with that. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned Safety Wing as well. They're, they're definitely yeah. a great company. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, seems like this is the last question here from William again. Um, what if your home has more holidays I guess your home country has more holidays or minimum vacation days versus where the employer is. Right. So if they're hiring you as a contractor, um, it doesn't really matter what, what that difference is, right? You basically will, whatever's in your contract is what you will agree upon, right? So you can try to negotiate more pay time off. A lot of the time for contractors, that's not included in the consulting agreements though, right? So it'll be more of a question of making sure that you negotiate a high enough rate a lot of the time or a high enough compensation where you can take unpaid holiday. You can basically not work on certain days and still, um, and still, be, uh, still make the amount of money that you want to make, right? Uh, if you have, um, I think it's always worth bringing that up to the company as like something that you want, but it's for contractors, it's usually a benefit that you have to negotiate like any other, right? Um, that, you know, this is something that you want and this is what you're willing to do instead, or this is, you know, the compensation that I can do given this salary. And if you want to, if I can't take this time off, then my salary will be higher, for example, right? Like, so, so on the contracting side is really a negotiation. Um, the, you can prob like you can probably negotiate it to be a little bit higher by sort of saying that hey like but this is the local requirements you know for employees and what I, the work that I'm doing is kind of like an employee right so there's there's an argument that can be made there if you are an actual employee like if they're willing to go down the subsidiary or PO route then the short story is that they will have to offer you local like whatever the local statutory require, required amount of PTO is right so if it's a company that's big enough where they worry about compliance, uh, you can kind of point them out to the PEO concept or the employment DOR concept or just a pilot's website. And we could help them set it up in a way where, you know, you are, you are going to be an employee and therefore you'll also get all of the statutory required benefits, contributions towards pension, pay time off, et cetera. So that's, I think the, the short, uh, the short answer is that it will kind of depend on, whether you're an employee or a contractor, in one case they're required to give you the local amount, in the other contracting path, it's negotiable like anything else that's part of your contract. Great. Um, yeah, that's thank you so much for for all of our or for your time here and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, I know I definitely learned a lot, and I hope everyone else learned a lot too. Thanks for asking your questions. Yeah. Um, Matt, is there anything else you want to add before we uh, sign off here? Um, I just wanted to say, um, if you all have any questions about working remotely or working with international companies, uh, this is my personal email address. You can reach out to me at any time uh, our mission at pilot is to create a more open worldwide job market and we're trying to do our part in making this world more connected and making it easier for companies to hire amazing people like you so if i can do something to help you land a remote job or help you convince your company to uh, hire you even though if you're you're in another country i'm i would be very happy to help and um you don't they don't have to be a customer of pilot. I just like to see more companies hiring internationally. So I'm always keen to help. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Matt. And uh, we'll be setting this uh, recording later in a couple of hours here. And um, as, Ma as our Matt also said earlier right. today, uh, stay tuned for um, another email tomorrow. Um, awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, have thanks, a great everyone. rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.